Yeah. All right. This is the next. <laughs> the next. The next chapter right. here. Cool. All right. So um, the next chapter. So we talked about um, thus far stateless services, right? Stateless services are arguably uh, pretty. I don't. I don't want to say trivial. I don't want to make it sound that way, but. They have their own challenges, but the, the thing that you don't really have to deal with is, okay, there's a service that actually has to remember something and I jumped ahead there. Sorry about that. Um, service that actually has to have local state. Let's say you got user input and it, and the service has to hold on to it. It has to maybe store it somewhere. Um, even, even with, with caching and things like that. So, or you have obviously a local disc. Um, and we often try to design our microservices so that we have these nice uh, databases, these pristine databases that live over here, um, or these distributed systems that try to um, hold on to, to to messages, and and those are those those systems are you need to take care of them because they hold your source of truth, right, of of, of your data. And so when you think about a service that may benefit from um, data or it requires data, you sort of have to isolate these two things. You have sort of the service deployed. It has to talk to typically a database, which is another network connection, for example, in network hop. And uh, you need to be able to um, interact in, in that way. So there are, might be cases that services need to, again, hold on to memory, uh, on to data themselves as well, um, which we'll kind of get to uh, in this yeah. next point. Uh, I, I was um, noticing that, yeah. Jeremy. That Hop oh in. yeah. <laughs> I talk about this a lot. This is like my soapbox, right? But I think like one, one of the things that's that's happening is we're starting to see like stuff like compute yeah. go out to the edge, right? Where um and and make it a lot more accessible. And that's mm -hmm. a good thing, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, the, the way I think about it, like the more that we can try to push types of infrastructure to operate more like CDNs where it's like cool, it's just like naturally globally distributed and you don't have to like think about it and it just kind of works. Um, the better, right? I would love to see a world where there's just more CDN like technologies that just kind of work. Um, and CDN being for like storage and serving up assets. Um, so what does it look like to then push our, our compute to the edge where we ha now have like cloud fl flare workers and edge func functions on Vercel and we have, you know, lambdas and we have a lot of really a lot of companies pushing, you know, what it looks like for edge. And what, what I mean for edge in this case is like the edge of the cloud. Like how can we get to a data center that's closest to us? And edge could mean different things, right? I think we have some people who are, their edge means they're out in some remote site somewhere and they're not even running in the cloud, right? And, and so, um, but one of the things that I've noticed with this trend of being able to push compute out to the edge is I hear a lot of developers now saying like, well, this is great. I get my compute on the edge, but like, if I need anything that's in my central data store, like not something that's in a key value store or not something that's in that's stateless that's coming in, um, then like I still have the same latency problems in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think one of the trends we're going to mm -hmm. continue to see is is a lot more companies, and this is where where we want to also try to be involved in in the conversation is how do we then like take our data and get it closer <laughs> to that compute on the edge? And I think this is kind of what you're what you're saying with with state is like state has to live somewhere, and so um, for most people their state is maybe in a centralized database in some you know cloud region somewhere and they just have to deal with the RTTs of that. And that that might be fine for a lot of people, but it also might not meet the requirements um, of somebody who wants to operate at the edge and have very low latency. So like, how do we solve that problem? How do we how do we then take state where it has to live somewhere, it has to be saved on a hard disk somewhere or be in memory somewhere? How do we how do we figure out how, that that kind of hard problem of distributing that data? And and so yeah, yeah. That, that that's kind of where that's my yeah. soapbox keep, keep of like data, data to the keep, edge. Yeah, yeah. How do we push it to the edge? I want to know more. Nailed it, nailed it there. Yeah, and I think it's it's one of those things where um, large localized clusters holding onto your data again isn't isn't really a great solution. And so I think again, based on the mindset of Nats and and thinking. Being being edge first, uh, frankly, uh, we're we're always trying to think of how can we how can we make data local to to on, 
on an edge device and how can compute run locally there with it? And there's different different ways of achieving that, but um, we just sort of wanted to show uh, what what that might look like uh, using using NATS today. So short slides, love it. All right. So we're back on screen. All right. So for this for this demo, um, we're actually going to create some create some streams now, and so we're going to show show a couple couple things here. Um, let's first just look at uh, create creating my origin stream. This is very simple. To uh, for those who haven't played with the NAT CLI, it's so powerful. It's awesome. Um, and you can essentially define your stream configuration. I just threw it in a file for right now. It's just a stream called events. And, um, and then I'm going to publish 100 messages into this uh, stream. So it should be pretty straightforward. Pumping the messages in. And so where does this, where does this stream live right now? It's an NGS. I, I didn't. Can't see anybody's hands uh, raising, so I just <laughs> answered the question. So yeah, so so this stream, um, because this is the hub hub cluster, this was actually uh, created in, in NGS. And uh, if we sort of inspect this real quick, we can see. I'm just gonna rid of this other tab. You can see, hundred messages are in there. There's a stream name. Now. Um, one of the really interesting features of, of streams and, and Jetstream is the ability to create what are known as mirrors, mirrors of streams. And again, the, the mirror construct is exactly what we need to support um, data locality uh, in the sense that if I'm able to have some origin stream that say it lives up in a cluster in the cloud, but I have a device locally that I might need to um, have access to locally, even if I'm disconnected, for whatever reason, um, and this extends out to the keep the KV API uh, as well. Just to kind of throw that in the back of your minds for the next uh, section. So we have the stream, and we want to be able to create uh, mirrors, and so we can do create. And so what what is this going to actually do? Oh, I created a single mirror. Let's change this. Oh, I want to create mirrors everywhere, all regions. So what is this doing? We are going to create a mirror of that origin stream that lives in NGS, and we're going to create a mirror of it in every leaf node that is deployed um, across all the regions that we did previously. So the way that this can work is that every leaf node can have its own Jetstream domain. And so it's sort of its own namespace you can think of within this broader broader kind of constellation. And uh, you create a mirror from that, specifying the NGS domain, which is the domain of NGS. And I say, I want to mirror the event stream within NGS down locally. And then the second step is to create a consumer, which we'll use in a, in a minute. So now I can create everything. That is so I did cool. Not try to paralyze this, but yeah. So, so one, now, one, what it's one doing? One questions that kind of came up in my head as you were kind of listing out back at the beginning all those technologies, and you were mentioning Redis, and I was like, um, "Well, you know, we have a KV, and in some cases it, it, it can replace Redis, but like a lot of times people run Redis very close to their application, so they can get like really tight, um, you know, latencies and, and and RTTs between Redis and the app instance." And I'm like, well, how do you do that with a with a with a NATS Jetstream KV when you might not be close to, you know, where that KV is running? You know, it might be on NGS in some region somewhere. And what you're doing right now is you're saying, well, we deployed all these leaf nodes and we have them kind of running in in Fly's data centers. Um, maybe we can get lower, you know, re response rates. Um, well, we get two things, right? We get we get tighter RTTs because the the actual read replica is closer to um, to the application or the service. And, and then we also get, you know, when that leaf node gets disconnected from the hub, it can still function and it could still, you know, read from its config, which is which is really neat. Yeah, that's right. 
So this is just kind of showing one of the leaf nodes um, up here, listing the stream out, and then in the NGS domain, which again is where the origin stream exists, we can see the event stream listed there. And notice that the mirror already has almost instantaneously all of the 100 messages because it's a direct mirror of the origin stream. So if we look at um, JS domain NGS, we'll see that this is deployed in AWS replicas. It also has a um, has three replicate replicas in this case, and this is a limits based retention policy, right? So just going to show a quick point here, which is when you create mirrors, you can create a mirror that has a completely different configuration. So although I am uh, mirroring a file-based stream that has three replicas and it's limits, limits-based retention, when I created my mirror, I said, I only want one replica because I only have one leaf node per region. I want to sort of memory and I want it to be a work queue retention. And so I can, I can completely change the configuration of my mirror that's appropriate for that data in that leaf node for that environment, for that use case. Right. So that's just something to kind of like keep in mind. And so if we go kind of the opposite direction, I could see a use case where maybe we have a bunch of leaf nodes and we're collecting data on those, right? And these might be smaller boxes. Let's say they're Raspberry Pis or something like that with not a lot of storage on them. And so maybe retention policy is pretty tight and we do a store and forward over to the hub in the cloud where the retention policy is like, pretty unlimited, right? And so we're, we're kind of mirroring or sourcing these streams. And yeah, the cool part is you you get a lot of the same data flowing through, but with different configurations. So you could do some neat stuff there. Yeah, that's right. So I use my magic trick again. Um, and magically, a new tab appears. <laughs> so oh, cool. if you want to interact with this, um, we'll see. We'll see if this works because I literally added this 20 minutes before the meeting, but hey, it works. That's cool. So what, what is this doing? Um, so this is another really interesting thing. So everyone is collected, connected to their leaf node that is closest to, to them. And it's actually going to be pooling uh, messages. You're going to be fetching me messages from the stream that is local to your, to your leaf node. And so you might have a bunch of competing people right now fetching different messages. See, I, mine just went from one to five. Oh yeah. And so yeah, what, yeah. what this is doing behind the hood is that you have a stream and you have this one, <laughs> you have the stream and one consumer defined, but we're all subscribing. We're all fetching messages to our local consumer that bound to that local stream. And so we're all just kind of like sharing, sharing this consumer right now. Uh, depending on your region. And so um, probably people aren't hitting ACK. And so what, what's going to happen eventually is that you're going to start getting re-delivered messages. But it's just something fun to play with, right? So these are all, um, let's see if we, we don't even know what happens if we run out. No more messages, maybe. Oh, it goes back. There it is. Redeliver count two. Right, so you hit hit the end, and it's start, it's starting to now redeliver unless you're acknowledging the messages. But but again, the key key point here is that we have one origin stream, and so if we go back here real quick, and we say inf, let's list our NGS stream. Notice uh, the NGS stream hasn't been touched because we don't actually have a consumer bound to to that. But if we do fly, we have one message because it's a work queue, right? As it's going down and being acknowledged as you, as you go down, it's actually um, re removing the messages from the stream. Mm -hmm. And if we look at consumer, info, You can see that we have that individual consumer, and there's nothing, nothing left. 
Very cool. And so we'll Mir- Mir- Mirrors kind of act as like the mirrors kind of yeah. act as digital <laughs> twins, right? Where, you know, you can, you can say, Hey, I, I basically want all the same messages that are coming through here to, to show up here. Um, w- which is great. Uh, we also have this concept of like sourcing, um, you know, streams where you can, uh, where you can mux and demux data. So, so again, back to that example where we might want to uh, mux data is we have all these leaf nodes in a, in a hub and spoke architecture and we want to collect all that stuff into like a centralized thing. So we might want to source all of those, you know, individual streams into a mega stream where we can throw it into like a data processing pipeline or whatever we want to do there. Um, but we can also demux data, right? So maybe we have a centralized stream that holds all of the data and that's where all the writes go to. And then we could fan those out to specific leaf nodes or specific accounts or whatever by, by saying, hey, you, you, get, you get a replica of this data, but only a portion of it. And you can filter it based off of you know, a subject or a wildcard and say, I just want you know, only this particular store's data um, to flow into here. And so there's a lot of really neat mixed architectures that you could do um, with that data. And uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's really, really neat the the different constructs that you have to be able to um, to know that you can replicate data with, with different sets of configuration. Very cool. Yeah, um, definitely. So I think we have one more one more thing to go over, and then we'll jump into the Q and A. We'll bring Derek back because I think you'll have a, a lot of fun things to say about um, some of the questions because you guys are asking fantastic questions. So I'm not uh, I'm not ignoring them. I mm-hmm. want to save them for our Q and A portion so we can bring Derek aboard to also answer some of those. All right, very cool. 